We were singing that song, as with every song of consecration, that you meant the words as you were singing them. We've been talking about divine direction and the divine will of God. That last verse says, take my will, take my will, and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. We've been talking about different sins that keep us out of the will of God. And most of the time it's because we have self-idolatry. We have things in our lives that instead of putting God on the throne, we put ourselves on the throne. And as a result, we are not doing the will of God. Our text tonight is Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 8. We continue our studies on divine direction, in particular dealing with divine direction and the motivation for doing the will of God. Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 6, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for the privilege of looking into your word tonight. Your word has so much to say concerning divine direction. Because you want us not merely to know your will, you want us to do your will. You want us to do it more than we want to do it. And there is no reason for us to be confused about your direction. There is no excuse for us to say, I didn't know what God wanted me to do. Because your word is full of divine direction in every area of life precisely what we should do and how we should respond and the motives that should move us forward so that we might be squarely on the path of righteousness, on the path of life, doing what you call us to do at our particular moment of history. We are yours, Father. And we come into your presence tonight, once again, seeking to learn by your Spirit and from your Word those things that you would have us not merely to know, but those things which you would have us to do. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The will of God and motivation. A major topic throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The will of God is clearly central to all of the Bible. Because God has given the Bible to us so that we might know his will but also so that we might do his will. That's the issue of walking by faith that we talked about in the message last week on Sunday morning on Reformation Sunday. Learning to walk by faith, the just shall live by faith. A central theme of the Bible, not one that we should ever tire of. One that we should learn with precision so that we might, when we stand before Jesus Christ, hear those words, well done, not merely well believed, but well done, thou good and faithful servant, not merely thou good and faithful church member, but servant. A servant is one who serves. A servant is one who does the will of his master. And so it's important for us as we study to know the will of God and then to obey the will of God. Our motivations are very important. First, doing what we do so that God will be glorified. That's the overall view of the positive motivations. The false motivations, the overall, is hypocrisy as the first evil motive. And under that, we saw the second evil motive was pride, then covetousness, then sloth, then anger, 
We saw that anger is a very key one because lots of folks in the church have anger and don't realize that that is keeping them out of the center of God's will. It's listed among the works of the flesh in Galatians 5. It is forbidden to the believer. Carnal anger is external proof that a man lacks faith and controlling anger is essential for the believer to accomplish the righteousness of God in the life of the believer. Very important wrong motive for us to have under control. We saw the sixth evil motive was gluttony, that it was clearly connected to other sins such as stubbornness, rebellion, drunkenness. The Bible connects gluttony to fornication. They're in the same category because they both defile the flesh, the body. God connects gluttony to idolatry, which is connected to iniquity, that's vile immorality, and fornication, which is connected to stubbornness, and those are all connected to witchcraft. Very amazing, because most of us don't think twice about gluttony. And yet God, through that list of connecting terms, connects it to witchcraft. Those connections are also made in the New Testament, not merely the Old Testament. Gluttony is listed as a reason for not inheriting the kingdom of God. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, rather serious issue for failing to bring the flesh into subjection. Gluttony is a reason for being a castaway, that is, not being fit for use by the master. And that brought us to the conclusion how you care for your body is important for at least four reasons. One, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Number two, how you care for your body affects other Christians who are part of that same temple. Number three, overcomers will be a permanent part of the heavenly temple. Number four, the glutton will not be prepared for the race and the fight of the Christian life, which is all about not merely believing, but doing the will of God. Like all addictive sins, gluttony is difficult uh, to overcome. We saw the Bible requires us to learn contentment, especially in the area of food. Then we looked at the seventh evil motive, which was lust. It's such a big problem that God devoted three whole chapters of the book of Proverbs and many individual verses to the issue of lust. That's 10% or more of the entire book dealing with that problem of moral purity and lust. We read key verses from Proverbs 5 through 7. We saw that Lust is a very key issue in the New Testament as well. We're told that we shouldn't stop and talk and debate with it, that we should flee from it. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee fornication. 1 Timothy 6.11, but thou, man of God, flee these things. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee also youthful lusts. We saw the Bible also warns girls and young women to avoid lust. The principal responsibility for their safety lies with their fathers first and then with their husbands second. Men are stimulated to lust by sight. Women are primarily stimulated to lust by fantasizing and touch. The Bible gives guidelines to help men avoid lust. And the Christian women should dress modestly to help men avoid lust. We saw many different verses on that. We saw that in Ezekiel 23, women can also be stimulated to lust by sight. To help women avoid lust, men should also avoid not merely physical touch and suggestive language, but should wear modest clothing as well as the women, clothing that does not emphasize the physical prowess of the man. Christian men should always treat women with greatest Christian purity and respect, and both should have responsibility for controlling their thought lives. We are to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, 2 Corinthians 10.5, which brought us to the youth rally verse, which we want to emphasize once again. We should be meditating on this and thinking about it each day in Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things, very important, are pure. Controlling your thought life in the area of lust. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any uh, praise, think on these things. And Jesus, of course, says the same thing in Matthew 5, 28. A man that looks on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. We saw that appropriate or inappropriate clothing says something about you. It's part of the way that you define yourself to other people. Your character, your actions, your motives, and your openness to immorality. We saw there was a strong distinction between love and lust. Lust can never wait to get. Love can always wait to give. We gave the illustration of Jacob serving for Rachel for seven years, and it seemed like nothing, only a few days to him because of the great love that he had for her. Lust wants to touch and grab now and stimulate the flesh of the lust object. Love avoids physical stimulation outside the bonds of divinely ordained marriage. Lust is selfish. 
Love is sacrificial. Lust plots how to achieve its own personal fulfillment. Love waits patiently for divine fulfillment. Lust can be natural or unnatural. We saw many illustrations of that. The biblical examples of sodomy and bestiality. Lust in Israel is given as a warning example to the church. God killed millions of people in ancient Israel because of lust and he'll do the same thing in the church. And Paul says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 6. These were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. We saw that there is only one remedy, one sure remedy for lust. This I say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Just like gluttony, drunkenness, sodomy, and other sins, we cannot blame God and say that God gave us a genetic disposition to lust. Every man, when he is tempted, is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Lust is clearly stated as an evil motive that keeps us outside the will of God. James chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. God. Peter tells us that lust is connected to rebellion against authority. Scripture says that lust is the corrupting influence in this decadent and evil world. 1 John 2, 16 and 17, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We saw that the eighth evil motive was envy. And we saw that there's a difference between envy and jealousy. Jealousy wants what another person has. Envy motivates you to destroy what another has if you can't get it for yourself. And we saw many, many, many verses in the Bible. We learned that envy is the submarine sin that most people are not even aware exists until it hits them. Envy hurts others, but the final destruction is to the man or the woman who is envying. Envy affects your health. Envy is worse evil motive for action than anger. Envy dies with the wicked. There will be no envy in the millennial kingdom. The destructive power of envy was seen in what the Sanhedrin did to Jesus. They weren't just jealous, they were envious of him. Pilate says it knew, he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. Envy was illustrated in the life of Joseph. His brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. That's quoted by Stephen in his sermon in Acts chapter 7 verse 9 and the patriarchs moved with envy sold Joseph into Egypt but God was with him envy was seen in the narratives of Jacob and Moses and when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children Rachel envied her sister and said that Jacob give me children or else I die a threat of committing suicide Psalm 106, 16, they envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron the saint of the Lord envy was illustrated by the Jews who opposed Paul Acts 13, 45, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. 17, 5, but the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and brought, sought to bring them out to the people. Not merely they were jealous, they were envious and they sought destruction. Envy is listed among the great sins of the reprobate cursed by God in Romans 1.29. Passage deals and ends with sodomy and the immorality that God curses. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. The only word in that list that has a descriptive adjective attached to it. Murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. Envy was found in the New Testament church. Philippians 1.15. Some indeed preached Christ even of envy and strife and some also of goodwill. We see 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 14. Paul warning Timothy about certain those who want to take control in, of the church. He says he's proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, and evil surmisings. He warns Titus of the same thing in Titus chapter 3 and verse 3. For we ourselves were also sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. James uses the same term in James 4, 5. Do you think that the scripture says in vain? The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. It is part of your old sin nature. It is a prominent part 
of your old sin nature. Envy is a principal motive of the carnal man. Envy is a regular habit of the sloth. Ecclesiastes 4.4. Again, consider all travail and every right work, that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. There's also vanity and vexation of spirit. The sloth doesn't want to work, but he envies you for what you have earned through your work. And as we noted last week, if you're paying attention to that list, it's composed of what's called the seven deadly sins or the seven mortal sins, also known as the capital vices and the cardinal vices, all of which manifest at different times by hypocrisy, the covering sin, with the pious platitudes and self-righteous posturing that so often even we as Christians do. And we saw that each of those motivations is a form of self-idolatry, putting ourselves on the controlling throne of our life. That's why we sang that hymn just a few moments ago rather than putting God on the controlling throne of our lives. So tonight we start the next evil motive, which is fear. Fear. I think all of us sense at different times in our life that we have been motivated by fear. The Bible has a lot to say about fear. We need to ask ourselves the question, when we are faced with a situation, am I doing what I am doing out of the fear of man, the fear of temporal consequences, or the fear of human responses? If so, we're not doing the will of God, and we are not being moved by divine direction. Rather interesting, I did a, a numerical study on different words related to fear in the Bible. The word fear shows up 400 times in the Bible. That's rather significant. The word afraid shows up 193 times in the Bible. The word fearful shows up 11 times in the Bible. The word terror shows up 29 times in the Bible. And of course, there are many other related words. We won't go into all of them. But there are many different underlying Hebrew words and Greek words that are sometimes translated fear. And we'll perhaps talk about some of those differences. But for our purposes tonight, that gives you a total of 633 times just with those four different words. That should tell us that fear is one of the most common evil motivations faced by man. Fear is the response that we have when we want to protect ourselves, which brings us back to that issue of self-interest, usually not interest in others, although there may occur a fear in the heart of a parent, for example, wanting to protect his or her child. Fear is the first thing that comes to our mind when we perceive a situation that we think is dangerous. Fear is the natural reaction to the flesh for self-preservation. Sometimes fear can be good and keep us from doing something stupid, like, for example, sticking our hand into the fire. But you know, that same response in relation to fire may also be an evil motivation. For example, some of you were here on Reformation Eve, October 31st, and we saw the Reformation Eve film Jan Hus, or John Huss. The pain of fire did not make him waver from his faith in Christ and recant that faith. The Catholic Church put a lot of pressure on John Huss. John Huss knew that if he did not recant, they would burn him at the stake. Now there's a normal reaction of fear to fire. And they tried to use that technique of fear to break his faith in Christ, to make him recant the truth that he had proclaimed. And they didn't just say, okay, if you don't recant tonight, we're going to burn you tomorrow. That doesn't give you much time to think about it. They kept him in prison. Day after day, week after week, month after month, moved him to various prisons. Occasionally chained him next to a, a latrine where that filthy stench made him sick. He almost died of sicknesses. They'd move him back, let him get a little bit better, and then they'd put the pressure on him again. And he knew that in the end there was fire. In the end there was fire. At one point, the Pope, who was sitting in judgment against him, because there were three popes <laughs> that were trying to rule the Church of Rome, let's say the organization, not the Church, the organization of Rome, were squabbling among themselves. One of those, who had actually been sitting in judgment, was taken prisoner and put in a cell very close to John Huss. He never broke. 
Fear of fire is normal. But when that fear is being used against your faith, the question will be, will you do the will of God? Or will you yield to the motivation of fear? Fear is real. You've experienced it. All of us have experienced it at some point in our lives. Sometimes it can be good. Sometimes it is an evil motivation. When it moves us or suggests to us that it is okay to compromise and step outside of the will of God. Consider also Thomas Cranmer, the English reformer. He had recanted, then he renounced his recanting. When he put to the flames, he first put his right hand deliberately into the fire, for that was the hand that had written the recantation of his faith. I think those illustrations help us to see that there are different sources of fear. One is the fear of man, which is an evil source of fear. One is the fear of God, which is a good source of fear. Proverbs 29 verse 5 tells us, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The opening chapter of the book of Proverbs tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of God, that's where you start on the path of wisdom. If you don't have the genuine fear of God, you do not have even the beginning of wisdom. But we're also told there's another kind of fear out there. That's the fear of man that brings a snare a trap, something that catches you for your life. The fear of man leads to death. The fear of the Lord leads to life. Oh, not just physical life in either case, though physical life may be involved, but to eternal life. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and Jesus Christ is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The fear of the Lord is what brings you to Christ. The fear of the Lord is many times paralleled with faith, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How about Proverbs 28.1? The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. The wicked have so much fear inside of them that they don't even know what they're running from. But those who are both made righteous and walking in righteousness have nothing to fear. Because they know that God is with them, their life is in his hands. If they depart this life, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 62 times in 25 books of the Bible we are commanded not to fear when we are in the favor of God. 62 times. 25 different books of the Bible tell us not to fear. They tell us that we can instead trust. You know, that should tell us something about our propensity to be fearful when 25 books of the Bible actually give us a command not to fear. Many times it's in the context of trusting or fearing the Lord. I'm going to read you just a few of those. This command gives us courage. Oh, how we lack courage in the American church today. Because we are so used to having it comfortable and easy. You know, most Christians around the world don't have so much to look forward to if they will just compromise a little. You and I have so much of this world's goods and this world's comforts that fear really is one of our main motives in making decisions because we think, you know, if I don't play this quite right, I might lose some comfort. I might lose something that makes me feel good. The command not to fear gives us courage to have the right motive 
in serving God and responding properly to his divine direction. Let me just read you a few of these passages. I mean, they run all the way from Genesis to Revelation. The command, fear not. Those two little words, fear not. And of course, there are many other passages that tell us not to fear, that don't just use that little capsulated form. Fear not, which is a command from God. Let me start in Genesis. We'll end with Revelation. Genesis 15, 1. Second time that God is giving his promise to Abraham. We find the great Abrahamic covenant given in Genesis 12. We find it again in Genesis 15, which we'll read in a moment. We find it in Genesis chapter 17. We find it again in Genesis chapter 22, where God restates the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, in each of those occasions for specific reasons on a specific occasion. But listen to 15.1. After these things, the word of the Lord, who is the word of the Lord? It's our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a theophany here. Christ on the very first occurrence of those two words in combination, fear not, is giving them to Abraham in the statement of the Abrahamic covenant. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. I think that's a pretty good place to start with the Abrahamic covenant. Why would God say, fear not to Abraham? It's to counter something that was inside of Abraham. Fear not. I am thy shield. A shield protects you from that which will harm you. Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield. But there's something else connected to not fearing here in this verse. Did you notice it? That next phrase. Not being afraid because we're trusting the Lord not only gives us protection, it also gives us blessing. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Not merely, I'll throw you a bone if you're not afraid. I'll give you a few Chinese baubles and trinkets if you're not afraid. Not merely, I'll give you a reward if you're not afraid. I am your exceeding great reward. Not merely, I'm going to give you one. I am your exceeding great reward. In and of himself, God is a reward to those who trust him and are not afraid. Oh, that we might know the reality of that, not merely have a head knowledge of it, but that we might know it, that he himself is our exceeding great reward. The next time we find it, God is speaking to someone that we might not necessarily think is someone worthy of those shield and reward blessings. In fact, we find it spoken to an outcast. Abraham himself and Sarah have just made this outcast. A young teenage girl named Hagar. And they've driven her out. God told them to do it, because in Isaac shall thy seed be called. But here now we find God speaking, because he hears the voice of Ishmael. God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not! For God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Fear not. Spoken to Hagar. Desperately concerned for her son. Heart filled with fear because this is a boy she loves. 
and God sees it and he hears the cry of the child and he tells the mother fear not Genesis 26 24 and the Lord appeared unto him in the same night and said I am the God of Abraham thy father fear not for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake Jacob oh that's a man who had a lot to fear because he was a crooked man he was a planter that's what his name means he was a man who was always conniving and trying to get for himself but because he was in the promised line that meant that even though he was bad God was going to fulfill a covenant that he made to Abraham back in chapter 12, chapter 15, chapter 20, uh, 17, chapter 22. Now we have Jacob. And God is speaking to him and he says, I am the God of Abraham thy father, fear not, for I am with thee. Genesis 35. Here we find human beings speaking. Rachel is about to have a baby. It came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. Yes, she had already had Joseph, and now she's about to have Benjamin. And Jacob names him Ben Yamin, son of my right hand. She names him Ben Oni, son of my sorrow. And she dies in childbirth. The promises of man may seem encouraging at the time. Only the promises of God last forever. Genesis 46 3 and he said I am God the God of thy father fear not to go down into Egypt for I will there make thee a great nation God speaking to Jacob he's just discovered that Joseph is still alive he's afraid to go down but God says to him don't be afraid because in Egypt I'm going to make you into a nation Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 21 behold the Lord thy God has set the land before thee go up and possess it as the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee fear not neither be discouraged you know Joshua repeats that in the opening chapter of the book of Joshua Joshua 1 7 through 9 be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Oh, that we might learn that principle. It's given to us here in Deuteronomy chapter 1. The first book of the law. Deuteronomy chapter 1. God tells them, fear not. Deuteronomy 20 verse 3 and shall say unto them hero Israel you approach this day unto battle against your enemies let not your hearts be faint fear not and do not tremble neither be ye terrified because of them folks do you ever do spiritual battle are you ever confronted with a situation where you know you must pick up the sword of the word of God against the hosts of hell and the world and the flesh and you must with courage step into the battle there's a good verse to remember you approach this day into battle against your enemies let not your hearts faint fear not do not tremble neither be ye terrified because of them fear is one of the motives that we have unfortunately it comes from our old sin nature it rises up against us every day every one of us faces certain fears 
Do we rise up to battle against the enemy? Do we heed God's command, be strong and of a good courage? Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. God spends a lot of time in his word talking about fear and courage. And there is only one fear that is legitimate, that's the fear of the Lord. The rest of the fear comes from the flesh or the world of the devil. Do we walk by faith? That's what the fear of the Lord is all about. Do we trust him day by day in the real situations of life? Are we courageous? Deuteronomy 31.6 Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. That's quoted in the book of Hebrews. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you believe it? Folks, if we believe that with all of our heart, that gives us faith in the living God so that no matter what circumstance of life faces us, we can be like Jan Hus, who knew that the truth prevails. Do you really believe that the truth will prevail? Do you really believe that Jesus Christ is the victor? And you have placed your faith in Christ and you are in Christ. You are under his protection. The enemy cannot do anything to you outside of the direct will of God. That when your faith is put to the test, the answer to the fear that rises in your heart is Christ. Folks, I think that probably if we live out our full lives, we will see times that are much more fearful than those in which we live. Right now, the specter of Islam is sweeping across other parts of the world, and we have rumors that they are here too the terrorist organizations, the bad things they do. We've seen illustration of it in 9-11. But it hasn't yet affected us personally. We've seen historical films, such as the film of Jan Hus, which we saw two nights ago. But it hasn't affected us yet. We know the enemies are out there. We know those who hold to a different theology, if you can call it that, are there. We read about Christians in India this morning who have been beaten for their faith by Hindus. Folks, it's all over the world. There is no reason that it cannot come to America. The question is, how will we respond with an evil motivation of fear so that we compromise the truth and what God has called us to do or will we respond with the motivation of faith? We believe the word of God, we know it is true, the truth will prevail and in the end God will be glorified because we respond by faith and not by fear. Now is the time to practice. We mentioned a moment ago all the little fears that come to us each day. We have little fears about our health. We have little fears about our finances. We have little fears about our friends. We have little fears about all kinds of dozens of different little things that happen throughout the day. If you learn to walk by faith in the face of the little fears and say, I will not fear those little fears. I will trust the Lord. I will walk by faith. I will be strong and courageous. I will not be dismayed because the Lord my God is with me whithersoever I go. If you practice with the little weights, then you're ready for the big weights. If you do your exercise regularly as you're running and practicing your race day by day, when the real race comes, you will be able to run your race with confidence with courage 
and with strength, divine strength that will see you through because you've seen God bring you through each of the little fears that you have had to face to get to that point where suddenly the door opens, the grandstand is full, the athletes are called to the track and they're lined up on the line. Or for the early Christians, the gates were opened, the grandstands were full, they were called forth to the center of the arena and another gate opened with the lions. Fear not, I am with thee. Are you practicing with the little things today? Or are you compromising with the little things today to keep yourself comfortable and relaxed and no pressure as you go about daily life? Fear versus faith. God gives us the command, fear not. And when we fear not, then we have our eyes focused with clarity on God's divine direction. Joshua chapter 8 verse 1 The Lord said unto Joshua Fear not, neither be thou dismayed Take all the people of war with thee and arise Go up to Ai See I have given it into thy hand The king of Ai and his people And his city and his land When you move forward by faith In obedience to the word of God God lets you take the land Fear not Joshua 10 verse 25 Joshua said unto them fear not nor be dismayed be strong and of a good courage for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight you know folks we talk in, in, in the abstract about our enemies the world the flesh the devil the demons we talk in the abstract about the battles that we have to fight we talk in the abstract about the spiritual armor of Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 20. But God calls us to put on the armor and to go into battle. Because he is with us. He is our strength. And he has given us what is necessary for the war in which, whether we like it or not, in which we are, in fact, engaged. But he knows our weaknesses. And that's why 400 times those two little words are found together in the scripture. Fear not. What an encouragement. I hope that encourages you. Oh, there are so many other passages in scripture. I look down here. I've got from Judges, from Ruth, from 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. 1st Kings, 2nd Kings, 1st Chronicles, Psalms, Isaiah, quite a few in Isaiah. Let me just read you a few of those out of Isaiah. There are, there are a lot of them in Isaiah. Isaiah 35, 4. Say unto them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not, Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Is that a pretty good promise? I think so. Do you have a fearful heart? You look at what's happening in the world around you. Remember that promise. That's Isaiah chapter 35, verse 4. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. How about Isaiah chapter 41, verse 13 and 14? For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. You know, I can remember when our kids were little, 
and something scary was out there and they were running around playing, you know what they would do? They would run over immediately and grab my hand. <laughs> if they had Daddy's hand, if they had Abba's hand, they didn't have to be afraid because they, they believed with all their heart that Abba would take care of them. That's what God says here. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. How about verse 14? <laughs> and listen to how he describes Israel. He calls Israel by the name of Jacob. Jacob is the man not walking by faith. God gives him the name Israel, Prince of God, because Jacob has these two natures fighting in him. So do you, so do I. Israel, a prince with God. Jacob the supplanter, Jacob the man who's always walking in the flesh, Israel walking by faith. And God plays those names against one another. We've seen that as we studied the book of Genesis. We went all the way through the book of Genesis. I hope you remember that. We saw that play as Jacob, Israel, is walking sometimes out of fellowship and sometimes in fellowship. Listen to what God says to him using the name Jacob. Isaiah 41, 14. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob. <laughs> Can you think of anything lower? That's how God addressed his own people. A people full of fear. He called them a worm. Fear not, thou worm, Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. No matter how low we are, even if we're worms, because we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, do you not think that he will also say that to us? I will help thee. Fear not, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. How about chapter 43, verse 1? Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Have you been redeemed? Have you been called by his name? Do you belong to him, thou art mine? Is he the one that created thee? But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, or we could say, O church. He that formed thee, O believer, fear not. For I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. You know, it goes back to your birth and before. Isaiah makes that clear. Thus saith the Lord that made thee, that formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Isaiah 54, 4. O oh, fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither shalt thou be confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Fear not. You know, we're so afraid that we'll lose face, that we'll be ashamed. God says, Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither shalt thou be confounded. You will not be put to shame if you trust in him. Doesn't matter what the world does, doesn't matter what the world says, doesn't matter whether you're counted, as the scripture says, as the off-scourings of the world. If you put your faith in Christ, not merely for your salvation, yeah, the fire escape route, but as you put your faith in Christ day by day to walk by faith, regardless of what the world does, someday there will come the day of vindication. Someday there will come the day when you stand before Christ and he clothes you with a beautiful white robe and he places on your head the diadem of the victor 
and you will not be ashamed at that day. Why should we worry about the shame of the world? Why should we care what people say about us? That's one of the things that got me through high school and college with all the pressures of other students. It was a little saying, I don't care what people think about me. I only care what Jesus thinks about me. Learn that or something like that. I don't care what people think about me. I only care what Jesus thinks about me. That'll get you through so many situations in life where otherwise fear will tempt you to compromise. I don't care what people think about me. I only care what Jesus thinks about me. You want to say it with me? Let's say that together. I don't care what people think about me. I only care what Jesus thinks about me. I hope you memorize that. That's what we're talking about here. That's why God gives us so many commands in the Bible with two little words. Fear not. Jeremiah 46, 27, But fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return and be in rest and in ease, and none shall make him afraid. That ties in with what we've been studying in the morning, the covenant of the land. There's a command to Israel not to be afraid, because God will fulfill his promise to bring them back and to give them the land. Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 57. Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee, thou saidst, Fear not. In the day that you call upon the Lord. You're in distress. You cry to the Lord. Does God draw near to you? Yes. And what does he say to you? He tells us right there. God drew near to you in the day that you called upon him. And what did God say? Thou saidst, fear not. If you could see God, and you're facing the worst terror, the worst fear of your life, and you can imagine it, I don't know what your fears are, I know what my fears are, but if you could face the worst terror of your life, and you're there trembling and sweating and shaking over this very worst fear, and the door opened and you could see him and God himself walked into the room and said to you fear not would it take away your fear if you knew it was God if you knew it was Jesus and he walked over to you put his arms around you and said fear not would that quench your fear you see, we want to walk by sight and not by faith. We're called to walk by faith. And Jesus has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is here. And when you face your fear, He is there. And you are safely enfolded in his arms just because you can't see him does that mean that therefore you have the right to be afraid fear not thou worm Jacob <laughs> I think the Lord looks at us and says oh those dear people how much I love them and how little they trust me 
And how often they're motivated to step outside of my will with that evil motivation of fear. And so they step outside and they wander in darkness and they stumble and they fall. And they have all kinds of conflicts and all kinds of problems in their life because they will not walk by faith. As we move farther through the Bible, we find God speaks to Daniel on two different occasions and tells him to fear not. Fear not, Daniel. For the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Chapter 10, verse 19, and said, O man, greatly beloved, God loves you. O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong. Yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Joel chapter 2, verse 21. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Do you believe that the Lord will do great things? We say, well, yeah, I know he's able to do great things. And yeah, I know he did some great things in the past. And I know he's strong because he made the universe. He made the earth. He made everything in the earth. He made, you know, all the animals. He made all the plants. He made Adam and Eve. You know, he has kept the earth going uh, through his strength and power for all of these centuries and these millennia. I mean, yeah, I know he can do great things. I know he's done great things in the past. I know that he split the Red Sea, that he brought Israel as a nation across the Red Sea. He drowned Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. He brought them 40 years to the wilderness. He fed them every day in the wilderness. They had enough water. They had enough food. I know that he brought them into the land. I know that he, you know, he wiped out the Canaanites in front of them. Do I believe that God can do great things? Sure. Do I believe that down in the future he's going to do great things way, way down the road there? He's going to judge the earth and the, all those judgments of the tribulation period that we mentioned just in passing this morning. The, uh, the seven trumpet judgments and the seven seal judgments and the seven bowl judgments. And uh, Is he going to do some great things? Yeah. Is he going to consume the earth with fire? Is that pretty big? Yeah, that's a great thing. Is he going to make the new heavens and the new earth where it dwelleth righteousness? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really great thing. But for me, uh, I don't know if he's going to do a great thing. What does it say? Rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. And that's why you don't have to be afraid. Oh, there are many more here in the Old Testament. Let me just give you a couple out of the New Testament. We find it frequently in the Gospels. We find that command given to Joseph. We find that command given to Mary. We find that command given to the women at the tomb. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not. <laughs> you know, Joseph was afraid to take Mary to be his wife. Joseph was afraid of what people might say. Joseph was afraid of public criticism. The angel said unto him, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't fear the person who can kill you. Fear the only one, and it's not the devil. Fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. That's God. There you have the direct contrast between the fear of man, which brings a snare, and the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. 
Matthew 28, 5, the, women answered in, uh, the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. If you're seeking Jesus, you have no reason to be afraid. Do you seek Jesus every day as the center of your life? Do you seek Jesus so that you might know his will? Do you seek Jesus so that you might do his will? Do you seek Jesus to give you the perfect peace that passes all understanding? Do you seek Jesus to give you direction in your life? Fear not. I know that you seek Jesus. That's a great message. Maybe I'll preach it sometime. The angel appears to Zacharias also. The angel said unto him, Luke 1, 13, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. So often we're afraid that God's not going to answer our prayers. Now, folks, he may not answer the way that you want him to answer it, but does God answer your prayers? Yes. In this case, Zacharias and Elizabeth were praying for a baby. They'd gone for a long time and had no children. Elizabeth was barren. But God within his sovereignty is able to overcome even human incapacity. And God can, and when he chooses to do so, will. Zacharias, the one big event in his life, the one time that he got to do what he was doing in the temple, because there were 26 different courses that had a two-week shot at doing the temple ministration. Those courses are outlined for us in the Old Testament. 26 different groups, each one got a two-week shot at doing things in the temple. And there were 9,000 priests per week at the time of Christ. 9,000 priests per week who had to rotate through doing stuff in the temple. And that would probably be the only shot that they got to do that particular job in the temple in their entire life from the time that they turned 30 to the time that they turned 50. They would have 20 shots at doing something in the temple if they were in one of those courses. And Zacharias was in the course of Abiah, which meant that was the group that was coming in to do stuff in the temple for that two-week period. And Zacharias got to be the one who offered the incense on the altar of incense. One and only shot at it. And as you know from our previous studies, I went through the tabernacle with all of its different articles of furniture. And we talked about what each of these articles of furniture represented, its typological significance, and how the altar of incense represented the prayers of the saints going up before the throne of God. It was right in front of the curtain that separated the holy place from the holiest of holies. It was as close as the average priest could ever get to the Ark of the Covenant, which was behind the veil. Only the high priest, once a year on Yom Kippur, could go behind the veil and sprinkle blood on the Hilasterion, on the mercy seat, between the golden cherubim to make atonement for his own sins and also for the sins of the people. And it was the veil that was rent at the death of Christ, showing that now our access to God is direct. And right before the veil is the altar of incense, which we're told in the book of Revelation, that incense going up is the picture of the prayers of the saints. Not the Catholic saints, the believers. Paul tells us, he tells the Corinthians, people who were sinful Christians, he calls them saints. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Zacharias, as he is offering the incense, representative of the prayers of all the people who have gathered out there in the courtyard, first the courtyard of the men, then the courtyard of the women, then the courtyard of the Gentiles. He's the one that's offering up the prayers. He has a prayer in his heart. Oh God, how badly I want a child. Please give me a son, Father. And he's fearful because he's an old man now. He's fearful that that prayer will never get answered. 
But here he has the privilege of actually being at the altar of incense before the veil that separates him from the Ark of the Covenant as close as he can ever hope to get in this life. And as he offers the incense, his prayer is, O oh God, give me a son. And when the angel appears, his heart is filled with terror. What have I done? If I see the angel of the Lord standing on the right hand of the altar of incense, does it mean that I will be smitten dead? And what a word of comfort he is given. Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Dear folks, we can come boldly through the blood of Jesus to the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need. There is no reason for us to fear. Luke 1.30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. The angel speaking to the shepherds said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. The ruler whose daughter had died and he had just heard it, it says when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, Fear not, believe only. Fear versus faith. Fear not, believe only and she shall be made whole. To those facing the problems of life, Jesus says in Luke 12, 7, but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Jesus speaking to the disciples in Luke 12, 32, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The triumphal entry, John 12, 15, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. God speaking, Jesus, in fact, speaking to Paul in Acts 27, verse 24, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Do you think it would be pretty scary to be in a boat in the middle of the ocean with no land in sight, total pitch blackness, no moon, no stars, the boat being lifted up 100, 150, 200 feet, and then riding down the trough and waves crashing across the deck and everything thrown out of the ship trying to lighten the ship and tying the ship up, undergirding it with ropes, trying to hold it together so it doesn't fall apart and the mass breaking and the sails dragging in the water and people screaming and yelling, 276 people on board this boat? Do you think that might be scary? If you got any sense of the ocean, you'd know that's scary. Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. We learn something in that. God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life that is a perfect plan and nothing can interrupt it. And God will see you through it and there is no reason to be afraid. That's an evil motive. You don't have to be afraid of people. You don't we have to be afraid of nature. You don't have to be afraid of animals. You don't have to be afraid of all the stuff that we're always afraid of. Afraid of losing our job. Afraid of losing our money. Afraid that the bank will collapse. Afraid that the country will go into depression. Afraid that the terrorists will come to the United States. Afraid, 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 afraid. God has a plan for your life. Fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar and P.S., I've got a little special bonus for the people who are your traveling companions. I could save you by myself if I wanted to and let all of them drown. But you know what? Because you're on board this boat, 
all 276 people are going to live. Every one of them is going to make it to land. We close with Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. Here's John about to receive the greatest revelation of future events any place found in the Bible. It's chapter 1. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. This is Jesus appearing to John. The great Son of Man vision. I'm the first and the last. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. That's Jesus who's speaking to John here. He sees a terrifying, powerful vision and he's about to see something that is even more scary as Jesus opens the future to him and shows him the judgments that are about to come upon the earth. He is so afraid that he falls down as though he were dead. He cannot move. He cannot speak. All he can do is sweat and tremble. And Jesus reaches out his hand and says unto him, Fear not. And the reason given is, I am the first and the last. I am in control of everything all the way from the beginning and all the way through the course of history and I am in control of everything at the end. Is that a pretty good reason to trust Jesus? Is that a pretty good reason not to be afraid? Is that a pretty good reason to walk by faith and not walk by fear? Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the great, precious promises of your word, all the commands, fear not. All the places in your word where we're told not to be afraid, not to be fearful, not to be terrorful, terrorized. Because you are God and nothing escapes your vision and nothing escapes your hand. You are in control. Oh, we're not in control. We try to be in control and then things fall apart. But you are in control. And we have nothing to fear. Because we are yours. And we love you, but more importantly, you love us. We don't deserve it, but how thankful we are that you love us and you say unto us, Fear not, for I am with thee. Thank you again, Father, for your word and for its power. We pray for your blessing on it to our hearts in our practical life day by day. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is hymn number 578, exactly along the lines of what we've been studying.